And hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode. Today, we have Daphne Mary with us. She's doing her psychiatry uh, residency in University of Toronto. Welcome, Mary. Hello, everyone. And uh, today, she's going to share with us her experience. Uh, she's an international medical graduate from Syria who came here and was able to successfully manage to psychiatry. Uh, it was a dream for her. She will take us through her experience, the exam she wrote, where did she do her medical school, how she was able to build connections here in Canada, and how she persisted in um, following her dreams when things happened and life became difficult. So Mary, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Like, uh, tell me about like med school. Uh, how was it? Where was it? When did you graduate? Uh, I did medical school in Syria. My university is called University of Tishreen. It's in Latakia. Uh, many people have never heard about it before. Um, it's, uh, although the city is beautiful, it's a coastal city on the sea, uh, but the university is less known compared to Damascus University in Aleppo because it's smaller in size. Uh, I did six years of medical school uh, and I graduated in 2015. And then oh. I came to Canada uh, in 2016. Okay. Uh, so when you came to Canada, like, uh, how did you start exploring the path about getting into residency? Uh, what helped you? What, what did you do initially? Um, so I, I knew that I was coming or planning to come to Canada right after medical school. So I think the first step was to uh, ask a couple of people who I could get to uh, through social media and who were other Syrian doctors who are here. <clears throat> so I contacted them, <clears throat> excuse me, and prior to coming. And the general path was explained to me is that there are ex exams that you need to write, you know, some sort of clinical experience, observership, research, or teaching, or academic activities to prepare for your application. Then when those are in place, you know, you would start thinking of applying and preparing for interviews. So I would say the first person I ever contacted was uh, another Syrian doctor who um, has been uh, working in Canada for a couple of years before um, hand. He had graduated from Syria as well. Uh, and he is basically the first contact I had. Okay. Um, so I think uh, let's go step by step. Tell me about the exams. What the exam did you wrote? How did you prepare for the exams? What resources did you use? Uh, at the time I was starting, the evaluation exam was the first step, what's known to be MCCEE. My understanding is that exam got canceled now. Uh, it was the first exam to write at the time I was starting. So I sat for it. And uh, I remember it took me about seven months to prepare for, for it. Uh, just because I was new to Canada, I didn't know really where to start, and I was a little bit bouncing back and forth. Um, the main resources I remember, I used Canada QBank, Master's Boards, um, Toronto Notes, few chapters here and there. And I think what helped me the most was uh, creating a small uh, group, uh, like a study group. It included uh, people from all over the world. I remember we were about five. And it was helpful to keep us in track. So what we do is we, you know, decide on a chapter to study, and then we discuss uh, things or do some questions together uh, via WhatsApp. Okay. That's that's that was the first exam. The second exam we had to write, and and I, you know, I I passed that exam. I would say at at that time with average score, um, I I, I think. Um, you know, it, it was, I think, in, uh, I think my score was 343, uh, exactly. Uh, it was considered average. It's not on the higher end, not on the lower end. It's, you know, average score for, for an IMG or anybody writing that exam. Um, and I was kind of like, okay, the first step is, is over. Let's think what's next. Uh, after that, um, I was advised to do the uh, oral exam or the NAC OSCE, because that one also was required to apply to the match. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the oral exam was de definitely more difficult. And the reason is, um, you know, you had to, to see a patient and speak in English and uh, it's different kind of like 
uh, type of exam that we, we I personally haven't done um, in, in Syria. You know, the, the uh, oral exams were in Arabic and it's a different kind of like structure. So that took some time. I think um, preparing for the OSCE is, is essential because they look at the score itself. And I think it plays an important role uh, when, when programs review your CV. So um, long story short, I took the NAC OSCE twice. The first time I took it, I had a very average score uh, in middle 70s. And then that year, they announced that we are eligible to repeat the exam if we were not happy with our scores up to three attempts. So what I did is I, you know, I took the exam first time. I got 74. I uh, had to take a course for it, which is a preparatory course on how to do it, how to study for the exam, you know, the physical exam. The, um, and then I again, studied with study partners and practiced and took the exam and I applied for residency. Uh, but next year I retook the exam for the second time to improve my score. And uh, in a little bit, I'm gonna explain why I thought it's important for me to retake the exam. Um, part of me, because I didn't match in the first year I applied um, and I was looking into ways to improve my CV and improve my overall kind of like, uh, basically points in when somebody's reviewing the CV. And I thought that maybe getting a higher score is a good idea. And that's what actually happened. So I, I retook it again one year after and I scored much higher. Uh, and then I, I applied for residency and that was the year I matched with, with the higher score. Gotcha. Uh, did you write the MCCQE1 before your match or no? No, actually, I wrote it uh, just prior to starting residency. Okay, okay. So I had, uh, uh, at the time of my application, sorry. <laughs> you already matched at before, like, uh, so you matched and then you wrote the exam. Yes, yes. I, I knew that I matched already. And, um, and then I, you know, for, just to clarify for the application, I had the MCCEE, the NAC OSCE, and the IELTS. Those are the only three exams that I used for the Canadian application. Gotcha. Um, and something that we should clarify here that the MCCEE, uh, the evaluating exam is canceled. So right now the MCCQE1 is a requirement uh, to apply for the Canadian residency match service. Uh, when Mary applied, it was not a requirement. So people uh, like me and Mary were able to apply with the MCCEE and the OSCE, but now to apply, you need the MCC QE1 and the NAC OSCE. Okay, uh, so after you wrote the exams, uh, did, you, uh, did you entertain the idea of writing the SMLEs, the United States licensing exams or no? I did actually, I did. I wrote the qualifying exam, MCC QE1 and step two together uh, okay. at the same time. It was, um, I think it was two weeks they were two weeks apart, uh, uh -huh. both of them. And the reason uh, I had in mind, because I didn't match one year in Canada prior, mm -hmm. and that was my second attempt, I was like, okay, I want to just prepare and have a backup plan. If I do not match this year, I don't think that I have much to add at this point. Um, and I would like to start exploring alternative pathways. So prior to getting the match result, I had booked for the qualifying exam and the step two together in June. Okay, and this is really smart strategy. I just wanna comment on that, that the step two and the QE1 have many similarities. And also like when it comes to me, I did the similar thing, like writing the Canadian, the US licensing exams at the same time. Uh, although it might, might cost more, but it saves a lot, a lot, a lot of time because the content is similar. The question approach might be different, but the, you need the same knowledge base for both exams. And I think this is really, really smart move. Um, so um, you wrote the exams. Uh, one of the important things also for the current is like getting uh, observerships or electives. The, can you tell me like if you do electives or observerships, how you were able to secure those observerships or electives opportunity as an IMG? Um, there was multiple ways to do that. I think I started uh, right away with, with 
looking for observ observerships and also uh, opportunities. I think one, you know, I'm going to mention a couple of things that worked for me. Uh, one thing was, um, you know, just uh, through LinkedIn. If you know, so if you look at the, if you look at the department, for example, of psychiatry in certain hospitals, you could see, for example, who is working in geriatric, who's working in child, who's working, and and then basically because these are, you know, um, um, education and. Uh, uh, they're always used to having residents and observerships. You know, usually their emails and stuff are publicly announced on the on the on the hospital website. So one way is to basically directly email them. Um, and you know, yes, you're risking because people don't know who you are. You know, it's an email coming out of nowhere. You know, could these emails go nowhere? Absolutely. You know, I emailed a number of people. Few replied. Some of them never replied. Uh, and you know, there is a chance. It's, it's a 50-50, but it is definitely one way to do that. Uh, another way was through LinkedIn. Uh, also, sometimes, you know, if you have a LinkedIn profile and also the staff and or the staff you're, you're looking, if you look their name and then they're there, you could, you know, send them a message introducing themselves and ask. Again, many people would not reply if they don't know you, but some would. Um, I, I was successful actually when one staff replied to me and I said, you know, right now my, my schedule doesn't accommodate, but he referred me to different staff names and I used that opportunity to use the name, you know, like I was referred to you by, yeah, although yeah. I never met the person physically and I didn't lie. You know, I said, you know, I had contacted Dr. X to, uh, to for an observership opportunity and, and I was referred to you. Actually, it worked. You know, when, when people start seeing that you're trying to build the connection, you're really not there yet, but you are, you know, honest about what you want. They, I think it, there is a chance that, you know, it's the, 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 you'll get a reply. The third method actually was going in person. Uh, um, so usually I, I advise against just going blindly and knocking on people's door because it's very odd. Uh, but again, like maybe trying to schedule an appointment with them might be helpful. The way I did that was at Mount Sinai Hospital, for example. I was volunteering there um, as an interpreter for English Arabic language. Uh, so I had a batch there, I had access, and I was, you know, sometimes there doing interpretation services as a volunteer, uh, and I actually walked just by the one of the staff, and I introduced myself to their uh, admin assistant, and I said, you know, this is my name, uh, I, ha I am a I, I'm an international medical graduate and I was hoping to, to have a five minutes with the staff just to ask them about an observership opportunity and it worked. Uh, again, I don't know whether that was the fact that I approached the admin or whether they you know, could see that I was volunteering in the hospital and I you know, looked as, a, as an okay face, you know, somebody basically who, who is already in the hospital, not coming out of the blue. But again, one of the things was in person, approaching people was helpful. Uh, and that's the other way that people could do, you know, through conferences and stuff. Like if you go to a conference and meet somebody or uh, get introduced to somebody, that also might be another option to, to do that. Oh, that's really smart. Like I'm always like uh, surprised by the ways that people find to get observerships and for me I think it was mainly uh, emailing people and I was also like I, I did something similar I was volunteering at the Ottawa hospital here and I was volunteering uh, as just like just a volunteer I, I, I used to guide people um, help them uh, like uh, when they are going uh, on and off the wheelchair uh, so I tried to walk and try to talk to residents and ask them like, do you know any international like, graduates, IMGs? And then from the IMGs, I would ask their experience and how they, if they can connect me with someone. Yeah, I think like just putting yourself, uh, immersing yourself and getting your feet wet, it's really important. Okay, so uh, like, can you tell me a bit about like how many observerships did you do? Uh, were they like hospital-based, clinic-based? Uh, were they all in psychiatry or like you did observerships in something else, like let's say family or internal? Can, can you tell me a bit about it, please? I think I did a total of four observerships in psychiatry and two in family medicine. Uh, the four in psychiatry were in different, uh, different settings. So, um, and, and that was of course on purpose. So I wanted to, you know, uh, 
part of me wanted to, um, you know, get further exposure. And part of me also wanted to get a variety. There is no right or wrong answer. Uh, some people, for example, do all observership in a specific area, like geriatric psychiatry. For me, my four observerships were variety. So one of them was in emergency psychiatry, one in geriatric psychiatry, one is was in consultation liaison psychiatry, which means a consultation service for medical, uh, medically unwell patients on medical floors. And the last one was uh, a community, uh, not even hospital-based. It was uh, with an ACT team. ACT stands for Assertive Community Treatment uh, Team, which, which basically means that you, know, you work with a team of a psychiatrist, nurses, social workers, and you go do home visits uh, or shelter visits or whatever. And the idea is to, make, to uh, provide psychiatric care for chronically ill patients in the community. And I think, uh, you know, that that uh, gave me more opportunity to speak about different aspects of psychiatry in the interview, because while I was doing these, you know, observerships, I was working about the different settings, the different variety, you know, different presentations. And I was, you know, kind of like having more personal examples to talk about um, the two other um, the two other uh, observerships were in family medicine. Um, you know, the full disclosure, they were back up. Um, they, uh, I, I kind of was like, okay, um, you know, I, I need a backup plan. Psychiatry, I think at the time I applied had been either 10, 10 different programs. And I was like, okay, maybe it's risky just to do psychiatry. So I applied, I wanted to apply to family as well as my backup plan, having in mind that, okay, if I get an interview or if I even match the family, you know, I could focus on providing maybe psychotherapy or, you know, family medicine with more focus on mental health. Uh, so I did, I did two observership in, in, a, in a regular clinics, outpatient clinics. They were both outpatient clinics. I was just seeing uh, anything from pneumonia to um, elderly, to peds, to anything, basically it was a walk-in clinic. Interesting. Okay, so outside of the observerships, uh, did you do like any community related work or extracurricular activities? Uh, like uh, you mentioned the volunteering, but uh, did you do anything outside the volunteering? Um, I think so volunteering evolved to work later on. Um, so, for example, I started volunteering with the um, um, uh, the uh, I'm going to get the name just one second, uh, the uh, Arab Community Center of Toronto. So I started volunteering there and then I got hired there um, and I worked with uh, youth as a youth settlement uh, counselor. Uh, and uh, through that work, I was doing a bunch of, you know, community service and some work there. Uh, it involved working with youth, uh, newcomer youth specifically, doing a number of activities, planning, and also fundraising uh, as part of the as part of the job and as part of the the working with different people as well. Um, I think that's the only that's the only thing I, I could think of. Okay, and this is something also important to highlight in your experience, like. Uh, you might start like in an unpaid position, but things can evolve to get paid. Uh, we all know like uh, the IMG journey here in Canada, it's, uh, it, it costs a lot of money. The exams are not cheap and having a source of income is really helpful. And also like working, uh, volunteering, it, it will help you to build connections. It will help you to know people and uh, it opens doors. It mainly opens doors. That's what happens with me too. It happened with me too. Um, so moving from there, uh, let me about like, did you attend any conferences uh, or like continuing medical education uh, and how did that help you? Um, frankly, I wasn't, I wasn't attending much of conferences and the reason basically was mainly financially. Uh, I, I, I felt I personally at that time couldn't afford, you know, traveling, going, or, or even paying for the conferences. I think the only conference I attended prior to matching was the uh, family medicine conference that happens in, in, and it happened in Toronto. It was in that year. It happened, I think, in Mississauga. And uh, from a psychiatry perspective, no, I, I did not. I did not attend any, any conferences that I can 
I can remember. Okay. Um, what about research? Did you do any and did you publish or no? I did. I did for a number of years, actually. So I think I did, I did between 2017 and 2019, the year I matched, I was working at uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, KMH, uh, in, in research. In the, uh, and I also worked uh, at Ryerson University as well as a research assistant um, in, in the nursing department. Uh, at, at the time of when I matched, actually, uh, I had a couple uh, presentations, a couple posters uh, from the, the work with Ryerson University. I did not have any publications at that time when I matched. Uh, of course, the publication, because it was a five-year project, it was, you know, long-term project. Yeah, yeah. So the publication happened, occurred while I am in, in residency, happened after I matched. And uh, believe it or not, until this day, I don't have a publication as a first first author because this is very common like people usually ask you know oh I haven't published as a first author you know this does that mean that my career is over my answer to that is you know is it depends on what you're looking for if you're looking for solely the purpose of matching and being a clinician and a doctor the answer is no you know you could match without being a first author you could definitely match um to a variety of programs and I you know talked to colleagues and that's not a problem if you're looking at an academic you know position and you you know you want to be a researcher I'm I, I can't answer that question you know I I don't know but for the sole purpose of matching it's it's totally fine you know not everybody is is a researcher not everybody has interest in research um, and that's okay I, you know, I'm always happy to help, for example, in certain projects and uh, support, but I never kind of like try to be the project lead or to be a first author. Um, and, and that's fine. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's really nice like to um, just talk about it. Yeah, I feel like because like getting, uh, doing, being first author as an international like graduate, it's, it, it's sometimes difficult, especially like, uh, Research is not something that we learn in med school, especially for people who come from different universities. It's not, it's not something that we are taught. Uh, I'm not sure how it's well taught in European or North American programs, but I can talk about like uh, my home school or in general, the Middle East. It's not, like, it's not very well taught, unfortunately. So coming here and not having that experience or not having a first author paper, uh, it's not the end of the world, but I think one thing to highlight from your experience is you worked in the research environment, like you were able to uh, show interest in the research. I I'm just going to ask you, like, how you were able to secure these positions? Like, what did you do to get, like, for this position? Believe it or not, it was networking. Gotcha. And so very, very full disclosure. I, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was doing an observership. Uh, at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and I was, you know, working with the residents and uh, I was asking them about research and, uh, you know, I was asking them what projects they were working on and one of the residents said, you know, hey, uh, Mary, there is, uh, you know, this opportunity uh, and at KMH and, uh, you know, they're looking and if you're interested, you know, I can just introduce you to the supervisor uh, and then, you know, you may uh, send them their, your CV and then, you know, see how it goes you know they will they may interview you and then you take it from there are you you know willing to and I said yeah sure please do that you know that would be a great favor and then that's exactly what happened so the resident had emailed the supervisor saying you know we have this um you know person her name is Mary Kozak she is an IMG work doing an, an, an observership with us and uh she, we were talking today and I thought to uh, I thought about your project and I was thinking to just introducing you together here is her CV. And then what happened is the supervisor, I think a couple of days later had invited me for an interview uh, and just to talk about the project and get to know me a little bit and who I am and what, what my interests are. And then that's how it all started. Uh, so yeah, and I, I continued to work from 2017 to 2019 uh, there. Uh, yeah, it's it was exactly like literally me talking to residents, a resident introducing me to supervisor, and then that's how it all started. Uh, and I want to say I had no previous research experience. I, I, you know, when, when the staff asked me, I, I 
didn't lie. And I think being honest is very important. Yeah, uh, because people could tell like these people are, um, you know, are, are looking for honest, hardworking people uh, more than anything else. Uh, and I think that that's important, too. Uh, you know, if you if you don't have an experience, you know, <laughs> at one point you have to be yeah, like, you have to be honest, right? <laughs> like you have, you have to be honest. Uh, you know, what's the alternative? You know, you know, what's the alternative? Ma making things up it would show. It would show if you're if you're talking about things that are made up, you know, and you're kind of making it, you know, at one point the person is going to realize that maybe you don't know what you're talking about. So I think um, again, I think knowing who we are and knowing and being honest about it is is pivotal. I agree, one hundred percent. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, that was inspiring. Uh, the last thing, interviews. Can you tell me a bit about like? How did the interviews went and like, uh, what did you do to prepare for interviews? I would say interviews are, are the trickiest part uh, because you're, you're putting yourself out there. You are kind of like worried, anxious, you know, this is, this is my future. And I think it's very important that people don't take interview preparation lightly. Uh, believe it or not, I, I worked harder to prepare for the interviews than to prepare for the exams. And the reason is, you know, if you finished medical school anywhere on the world, you probably know how to study. You know, you have the, the stamina to sit yeah. and study and read the material, absorb it. You know, you don't need anybody to teach you that. But I think most of us would benefit from advice around you know interview and how to present yourself um again because there is actually there are many cultural differences and you know this is your future so you want to you want to appear interested but at the same time you don't want to appear super anxious or desperate and those need practice so for me things i did is i definitely had uh, i definitely seeked professional help to edit both my CV, personal statement, and also uh, to do some interview preparation. And how it went is, you know, there are standard in interview questions everywhere uh, on the internet, you know, anywhere you look, interview questions for, for residency. And then, what would, you know, I would uh, either write the answer, prepare the answer, say it, and I would get some advice uh, around it. Most common questions are, you know, tell us about yourself, strength, weaknesses, those are usually standard and then some program specific questions like why are you interested in the program at for example university of toronto versus ottawa versus manitoba and i think these also take time to research the program you know uh look into what they offer see if that matches with your interests or it doesn't uh because these things are going to come up in in the interview um, and, you know, it's important that they see that you did your homework and you know what you're applying to. So mm -hmm. I ended up, you know, one of the strategies I did is practicing with family members. And another strategy is I sometimes videotaped myself and I listened to it uh, just to make sure, you know, that I am not. And, and, and just be careful because because I at some point noticed because I was repeating myself so much at one point I was sounding a little bit robotic. So again, you know, I had to adjust a little bit because I, I was practicing so much. So I memorized the question at the point that it, it was like re literally like reading a recording. Uh, yeah. yeah, but 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 I think it, it helped. Okay, that's great. Uh, so lastly, what is like your advice for people who are going through the current right now, buying and trying to get into residency? Like if you can tell them like, the summit of your experience, take home point, what would be? I think, you know, I would advise everybody is to, to know that it, it is it is stressful. And at the same time, it is, uh, there is hope. I think the main message I want to say to everybody that there is hope. Uh, it's, it's important to know who you are and what are you willing to sacrifice and what 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 fits with your you know wishes how you know at, at the end of the day the career becomes part of our life so you know my advice is to really be honest when applying 
do I see myself as a psychiatrist? Do I see myself as a family medicine doctor or a, or a surgeon or an internist? And, um, you know, also about the, the programs or where you're applying, because, um, you know, some people would say, okay, a, a matching anywhere is better than not matching. I don't know, I'm in third year residency and I kind of largely disagree with that. I think matching to somewhere that um, you know you're not happy or you know doesn't fit with who you are is is really what would harm you on the long term. And the last but not the least, you know, really be honest. Uh, and uh, you know, I, uh, I I I said throughout the interview, but I'm going to repeat it again. I didn't match from my first uh, time. Um, I think I the first time I interviewed, uh, I. I, the first time I, I applied, I got an interview. Uh, I went and I did the interview, it didn't go well. Um, and I didn't end up matching. And that was really disheartening. But at the same time, the fact that I got an interview was reassuring to me that, you know, my file is good. I can improve on it. So what I did is uh, I, um, I accepted a, um, a research position at Ryerson University. I had uh, done some work there, I improved on my CV, I applied for the second iteration, I had gone, gotten an award, uh, and in the second iteration, which, you know, people have the, the idea that nobody gets interviews, I got interviews, because basically what second iteration is, is, is stands for leftover seats, like the seats that are unfilled from the first one, and then I got actually more interviews in the second iteration, and I was like, wow, maybe I'm on the right track, you know, this is a good sign. I'm still getting interviews, you know, I should keep going. So I went, I did those, they were out of the province and I didn't match either, but I didn't lose hope. And again, I'm gonna keep telling people, don't lose hope because look, look at your CV, review, like what can, what can I do better? At that point, you know, I sat, I reviewed my CV, I was teaching, I was doing research. Okay, what can I do better? So. For me, I identified that the NAC OSCE score could improve from the 75. So I retook the exam. And um, at that year specifically, I had been working longer in research for two years at, at the KMH. So I felt that the staff had known me better. I asked the staff for a more detailed letter of recommendation and I went all in. So believe it or not, from you know getting one, two interviews, I got 10 interviews in the year that I matched. All, basically, almost all the, the psychiatry programs interviewed me that year, and I matched to uh, my first choice, University of Toronto. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, honestly, I, I, I wish everyone the best of luck. And, uh, you know, I always say, if I could do it, you know, you, you can. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not a super smart person, I'm, you know, average, in most of the things, uh, but I think that I persisted, I showed interest and I worked hard. Um, if you have any specific questions for uh, psychiatry specifically, please feel free to leave a comment and uh, we'll get back to you. That's so lovely, thank you so much. Like, uh, I think like, this is very inspiring. Like I get inspired every time I interview people and I, this is still inspiring for me, despite me being in residency, but like, I think you're a very nice example of a very hard, working person who is persistent and so you didn't let life decide what you want to do you decided what you want to do thank you so much appreciate it thanks for having me thanks Robin